This thing of the, the world appearing to be a very different place depending on what kind of animal you are is something we came across when we were in, in China. And we went to look for an animal called the Baiji, which is the, um, the Yangtze River dolphin, which is an almost blind form of dolphin. Um, the reason it's almost blind is that there's nothing to see in the Yangtze River. <laughs> um, many, many years of agriculture, thousands of years of agriculture along the banks of the Yangtze have washed more and more topsoil and silt into the river, so it's become increasingly turbid, and, there is, and, and the uh, uh, visibility is, is virtually nil within the river. Now, this is fine as far as the dolphins are concerned, because dolphins have a capacity to, um, to learn uh, sonar techniques. So they, the dolphins navigate their way around the river by sonar. Uh, which and modeling the world and sound can be almost, so far as we can tell, almost as detailed and accurate and three-dimensionally informative as vision. It's hard for us to visualize, and the word I say, uh, the word itself is a clue, because we are, we are very much light-oriented, sight-oriented animals. It's hard for us to, it's hard not to say visualize, it's hard for us to visualize what the world would look like if you perceived it in sound. But anyway, <laughs> that's what the dolphins do. And this was fine up to the point when man, God bless him, then discovers the diesel engine. <laughs> and having up to that point been filling the, um, the, the Yangtze with uh, silt, uh, with sewage, with, with every kind of waste that we want to get rid of, now starts to fill it with noise as well. And um, as a result, many of the dolphins are, are continually... Uh, whereas previously they were able, as I say, to uh, model their world fantastically accurately in sound um, and, and find their way around it uh, as easily as you and I can find our way around a room, they're now bumping into boats and getting caught up in ships' propellers or sh caught up in fishermen's nets. They're obviously being thoroughly disoriented by this noise. So we arrived there and we thought we'd better find out what it sounds like in the Yangtze River. Um, because... Um, it, it's, it's hard for us to get a kind of feel of what this is like. Um, and we were recording this for the BBC, and we had a BBC sound engineer with us. Um, and we said, let's record what it sounds like in the Yangtze River. And he said, well, I wish you'd told me that before we left London. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, well, you know, you can't just stick a microphone in the water. You need a hydrophone. You need an underwater microphone. I haven't got one. And, um, you know, if you tell me we can find one in Shanghai. Um, so I said, well, we, I really want to record this noise. What, uh, what are we going to do? And he said, well, there is an emergency technique we're taught in the BBC. <laughs> there is a way you can waterproof a microphone in an emergency. I mean, sound quality won't be that good. But I said, well, it doesn't matter about sound quality. I mean, what's the technique? And he said, well, what you do is you get, you get an ordinary microphone and you stick it in a condom. And he looked at me and my colleague, Mark, and said, have either of you got condoms with you? And we said, <laughs> no, we hadn't. It wasn't that kind of trip. Um, <laughs> so we had to go and spend a happy afternoon in Shanghai trying to buy a pack of condoms. Now, we all know about uh, um, the, the Chinese um, uh, policy of uh, dual population. Um, so we thought, it was going to be, we thought it was going to be a lot easier to find condoms than it actually turned out to be. So I want to read you a short passage about this. <laughs> Trying to buy condoms in Shanghai. <laughs> the friendship store seemed like a promising place. place. <laughs> ah. <laughs> the friendship store seemed like a promising place to buy condoms. But we had a certain amount of difficulty in getting the idea across. We passed from one counter to another in the large open-plan department store, which consists of many different individual booths, stalls, and counters. But no one was able to help us. We first started at the stalls, which looked as if they sold medical supplies, but had no luck. By the time we got to the stalls, which sold bookends and chopsticks, we knew we were on to a loser. <laughs> but at least we found a young shop assistant who spoke English. We tried to explain to her what it was we wanted, but seemed to reach the limit of her vocabulary pretty quickly. <laughs> I got out my notebook and drew a condom very carefully. <laughs> In 
including a little extra balloon on the end. She frowned at it, but still didn't get the idea. She brought us a wooden spoon, a candle, a sort of paper knife, and, surprisingly enough, a small porcelain model of the Eiffel Tower. (laughs) And then, at last, lapsed into a posture of defeat. Some other girls from the stall gathered round to help, but they were also defeated by our picture. At last, I plucked up the bravado to perform a delicate little mime. (laughs) And at last, the penny dropped. Ah, the first girl said, suddenly wreathing smiles. Ah, yes. They all beamed delightedly at us as they got the idea. You do understand, I asked. Yes, yes, I understand. Do you have any? Uh, No, she said, not have. Oh, but, 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 yes. I say you where you go, okay? Oh, well, thank you very much, thank you. You go 616 Nanjing Road. Okay, have there. You ask Rubber Rover, okay? (laughs) Rubber Rover? Rubber Rover, you ask. They have. Okay, have a nice day. (laughs) We thanked them again profusely and left with much waving and smiling. (laughs) The news seemed to have spread very quickly around the store and everybody waved at us. When we reached 616 Nanjing Road, um, our pronunciation of rubber over seemed to let us down and produce another wave of baffled incomprehension. This time I went straight for the mime that had served us so well before, and it seemed to do the trick at once. The shop assistant, a slightly more middle-aged lady with severe hair, marched straight to a cabinet of drawers, brought us back a packet, and placed it triumphantly on the counter in front of us. Success, we thought. Opened a packet and found it to contain a bubble sheet of pills. Right idea, said Mark with a sigh. Wrong method. 